Hi, I'm Bill Perkins. Welcome to Compass TV. If you love the Lord, love your Bible, and love to learn, you're going to love this presentation. When asked to explain or defend how God created the earth in six 24-hour days, most Christians would rather change the subject. <laughs> Yet there are myriads of undeniable scientific facts that prove the Bible's accuracy in Genesis 1. So using everyday Laban's language, Russ Miller walks us through 10 scientific truths that make the theory of evolution look downright stupid. Enjoy Defending Biblical Creation by one of America's top creationists, Russ Miller. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> well, I accomplished my first goal, which was not tripping, coming up over the stage. <laughs> so it's good to get off to a good start. Um, thank you. <laughs> That'll do it for me today. We'll see you. No. Um, <clears throat> Well, again, my name is Russ Miller. My wife, Joanna, and I, we have a ministry that we feel God called us to steward that we call Creation, Evolution, and Science Ministries. Uh, we came up with that name because sometimes uh, we talk about creation and biblical accounts, and sometimes we talk about uh, Darwinian evolution and Darwinian accounts, including their, their magic ingredient, their foundation, millions of years of time. But we always try to tie these religious beliefs, and they're both religious beliefs, by the way, into the scientific evidence. And what I want to show you today is real science is a believer's true friend. Always has been, always will be. False science, that's a whole nother issue. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you some false science this morning as we go through the top 10 teachings of Darwinian evolutionism. You know, the Bible says that professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. It doesn't mean that someone is stupid. The, I know brilliant people that have been fooled into believing in the Darwinian teachings. I mean, really and truly, it's the only thing that's taught in our media, public schools, universities, entertainment industry. It's the only thing taught. I understand people being fooled by it. Now, I used to be what you would call a theistic evolutionist. Uh, studies say half of people in church today are either theistic evolutionists or progressive creationists or gap theorists or some other belief that isn't found in the Bible. And if I just stepped on your toes, trust me, I'm doing that for a good reason. Try to find those Jesuses in the Bible. There's only one found in the Bible, and he's not any one of those three. The fact that there's three might make you think, wow, what about that? So let's think about this. Professing to be wise, they've been fooled. And they've changed the glory of the uncorruptible God, which I think today is his creation, into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. I think they're going to change creation into the fairy tale of Darwinian evolution that lets you think you're the most evolved, you're your own God. Or you can just invent whatever you want to believe because you're actually putting your, your knowledge, your man-made knowledge, above the word of God. It's a dangerous place to be. Now, now, these verses are talking about idolatry. And the highest form of idolatry is to think you're your own God. We call this humanism today. They think they're the most evolved, and they make themselves their own God. So I get a lot of weird emails. Here is one, and this is very typical if you speak on a college campus. You'll get this from all the students. You make Christians look stupid when you attack science. Face it, evolution is a proven fact. Look closely at this. This is common today. They're confusing science with evolution. They think they're one and the same. They're not one and the same. Science, real science, a believer's best friend, is knowledge derived from the study of evidence. Evolution, Darwinian evolution, and biblical creation are both the exact same thing. They're both beliefs on how we came about. Neither one is science. They're a belief on how we came about. So let's take some science and let's look at the story of Darwinian evolution. You know, the Bible warns us, Beware lest any man, any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. And there are really only two viable views and options out there for our origins. Either God created the world just like he says he did, or the world evolved on its own, like we're taught in our humanistic schools and textbooks. Now, I live in northern Arizona near Sedona. Any of you ever been to Sedona? You know, this is like the New Age capital of the world. Well, they have that group there that says, well, maybe we're not here at all. Maybe we just think we're here. <laughs> but as a general rule, I don't pay much attention because we really are here. So 
the two viable options, biblical creation, Darwinian evolutionism. You know, the Bible says, prove all things and hold fast that which is good. Now, we're supposed to have faith, but God wants us to prove things. You know why he wants us to do that? Because the truth will always support God's word, because God's word is the truth. So he wants us testing and proving things. And remember, operational science, what I call real science, is knowledge derived from the study and testing of existing evidence. It has to be there to test, study, and observe. So let's go through the top ten supposed evidences or proofs of Darwinian evolution that have undermined the faith of so many people that we're actually losing about, 10, uh, about 90% of our kids by the age of 20. And I'll bet you there are people in here that are, have victims in their own family, most likely every single person sitting here today. So we're going to go right through these, these top 10. Uh, evidence for Darwinism, number one, is that life came from non-life. Now, Darwin wrote that it started out in a little warm pond, and then maybe it was, it was a lightning bolt that started life, because we see lightning start life all the time, don't we? <laughs> Anyone step outside in a lightning storm with a big metal rods hoping to improve your life, right? Yeah, that happens all the time. Now, I want to be as fair as possible. The other side absolutely is unfair and crush Christian children openly, especially in the universities. But I want to be as fair as possible. A Darwinist will deny today that Darwinism has anything to do with the start of life. Now, the reason for that is the start of life, spontaneous generation coming from non-life, is a scientific impossibility. It's been debunked time after time. So today, they will claim, well, Darwinism has nothing to do with the start of life. So I want to be fair and make sure you understand that the origin of species has actually nothing to do with the origin of the uh, species. So, with spontaneous generation being totally debunked, they've gone to a biogenesis. So, oh, a biogenesis. It's basically abracadabra, but a biogenesis. And that's spontaneous generation, but it's spread out over a long period of time. Instead of just boom, life started, there was this long period of chemical evolution, but somewhere they still had to have that moment where poof, life started uh, immediately, this has never been observed. Now, real science, a believer's best friend, we have the law of biogenesis, real science, says life can't come from non-life. You cannot get non-life to produce life. It's a scientific principle. You know, the Bible, the only book in the history of the world to live on its ability to correctly predict the future, you know, thousands of prophecies made that have come true um, Here's one given to the ancient Israelites in the book of Jeremiah, that people are going to turn their back on God, saying to a stone, thou has brought me forth. <laughs> saying to a stone. Well, listen, now, now that was the ancient Israelites, right? I mean, today in the 21st century, we, we would never let anyone tell us we came from a stone, right? We're too smart for that, right? Well, let's go to the modern textbook, see what's taught. Kids, kids, earth is thought, believed, to a form four and a half billion years ago, and it started out as a big ball of hot rock. And oceans formed as it rained on the stone, I mean the rock, for millions of years of time. They're teaching we came from a stone. And <clears throat> here, here you are sitting here with this wet rock that has no life whatsoever on it. Where do they get life started? I have Darwinists come to me all the time. Oh, you believe your invisible God created the world. And I say, you think we came from a wet rock. <laughs> and it takes the wind right out of their sails. Try it sometime. And they will say, oh, that's a lie. And then just go back where you think this big bang, and don't get into which one. I think we're in our fourth or fifth version now. But you believe in this big bang and a big rock formed and it rained on the rock, right? Yeah. Well, you're sitting there with a wet, sterile rock. Where do you think we came from? And they'll go, wow, I do think we came from a wet rock. And... You've just prepared the soil to plant the seed because they think their belief is scientific when actually they've just realized, wow, this is rather ridiculous. So they try to get kids to think, well, well, scientists working in labs have been able to get over the law of biogenesis and get life to come from non-life. But if you look closely at all these experiments, I'm talking literally hundreds of thousands of such experiments, you'll find they've never come anywhere near creating life from non-life. Now, they have been able to create some amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins, but amino acids are non-living chemical compounds. And there are hundreds of amino acids, but there's 20 specific ones for life. 
that all have to be right-handed, excuse me, left-handed with all right-handed nucleotide sugars. There's no mathematical possibility of that happening by accident. Life has never, even in labs, been created from non-life. The law of biogenesis has never been overcome. This former Harvard professor and Nobel Prize winner said, Modern biologists, having reviewed the downfall of spontaneous generation, yet unwilling to accept creation, are left with nothing. They've got nothing, but they own the system. So they can't get life started. So think about this logically. The world's brightest scientific minds, building on years and years of hundreds of thousands of other scientific experiments, uh, with billions of dollars of salaries and lab equipment and computers thrown in, cannot get life to start from non-life. Yet they teach our children that, that this happened long ago and far away with rocks and seawater. Oh, but not today when you can show it happening. No, no, long ago and, and far away. That's not science, my friends. So I spoke at uh, Northern Arizona University. It, it had such an impact. It was on the front page of their school paper four weeks in a row. It was like World War III, and the, the professors, science professors, gave their kids extra credit to come there and attack me. It was fantastic. It totally filled up the auditorium, and then I just slaughtered Darwinism for them. And it was on the front page of the, of the paper for four weeks in a row, including my whole testimony on this anti-Christian, anti-American college newspaper. Well, they started a class. So one biology teacher, by the way, after seeing my presentation, quit her job and became a Christian. <laughs> and now teaches science in a Christian school, real science. But the school, one anti-Christian, anti, uh, horrible uh, anti-Christian uh, professor, he started an accredited class attacking me and biblical creation after that. Uh, they ran for at least four years. I don't know if they still run it or not. But in, in that class, they used the book written by the president of the National Center of Science Education, who is a, a world-renowned, outspoken atheist. That's where she comes from. We all have a, a bias. That's her religious bias. And they used her book. So I said, well, let's use the book from, you know, this, this college textbook from the president of the National Center of Science Education to see how they get over the law of biogenesis. How do they get life started? And on page 26, is, she says, the origin of life was a continuum of events of biogenesis with a lot of iffy stuff in the middle. <laughs> yeah, I'm not making it up. It's right there. You can Google it. Page 26. That's the modern college explanation of how life started without God. Evidence number two. Well, you know, the life started, it wasn't anything complex. It was just a, a simple cell. Nothing complex. In fact, this textbook says all the many forms of life on earth today are descended, stated as a scientific fact, are descended from a common ancestor found in a population of primitive unicellular organisms. How in the world would a kid stand up and argue with that? They've they just been told it's a scientific fact, correct? Well, what evidence do they have? You know, it says right here, no traces of those events remain. From the Big Bang, to the Big Rock, to the rain on the rock, to the poof moment where life overcame the law of biogenesis and all the iffy stuff, to this common ancestor, there is not a shred of scientific evidence. This is a religious belief. And if they took it out of the schools and put it in a child's book and started out once upon a time, I wouldn't have a problem with it. But when we're losing 90% of our children over this teaching, is anyone with me thinking maybe it's time we say something about it? Yeah. And I thought science was knowledge derived from the study of evidence. There's no evidence of this whatsoever. It goes against multiple scientific principles and laws. Let's just take a look since they say, well, it was just a simple cell like a bacteria cell. Well, how simple is a, is a bacteria cell? You know, they're run by tiny molecular motors, um, and these molecular motors called bacterial flagellum, allow the cell to swim around and perform its various functions. It can even switch gears depending on how much weight it's towing or pushing. Now, it's made up of about 40 different very complex and specific proteins that have to be there in the exact order to form that molecular motor at the very start of life or life couldn't start. Oh, and the problem gets worse for Darwinists. To put the flagellum in the correct order requires other molecular motors that have to be completely whole and exact order 
for life to start. The more real science, a believer's best friend, gets into the cell, the more complex it becomes, the exact opposite of what Darwinism predicted. Now, you're made up of an estimated 75 trillion cells. You know, we don't understand trillion. We, we, really, billion is beyond our comprehension. I think we can get a little bit of a grasp on a million, but just to get a, get a handle on these numbers, let's use a minute. There's 60 seconds in a minute, so let's use seconds. A million seconds ago was 11 days ago. It was a week ago last Tuesday. That was a million seconds. Well, what's the difference between a million and a billion seconds? Well, a billion seconds ago was back in 1989. Big difference between a million and a billion. Oh, and a trillion seconds ago would have been more than 30,000 years of time. And we're how many trillions in debt? Oh, wait, I'm sorry. That's a, that's a whole other issue. But, so you're made up of an estimated 75 trillion cells. Each of your cells' DNA contained 3 billion base pairs of genetic information per cell times trillions of cells. And this is so compactly stored that the genetic information to code all 7 billion people on Earth could fit into a container the size of an aspirin. Talk about unbelievable complexity and design that's beyond human comprehension. Wow, this points right toward our biblical creator. You know, in fact, genetic information, when, when the RNA DNA system was discovered, it should have brought any, any argument or debate between creation and evolution to a screeching halt. But um, Darwinism is a religious belief, so they, they zealously support it. But the best human technology reads in one direction, the best that we have. We now know genetic information reads forwards and backwards. And they're starting to think it might read diagonally. Just to get a grasp on the complexity of that, let's say you had a, uh, wrote a 30-page uh, paper. Not billions of pages like our genetic information, but just 30 pages. In fact, one page. One page of information, let's say, giving the directions on how to operate a cell phone. And it has to be able to read backwards and explain uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity. Yeah, we can't even do that with computers. But that's what God has done with our genetic information. One mathematician and molecular biologist calculated the odds of just one DNA chromosome forming on its own by natural processes to be one in 10 to the 100 billionth power. What kind of a number is that? Well, one in 10 to the 50th power is usually considered to be absolute zero. One in 10 to the 100 billionth. Well, in Arizona, I don't know about Idaho, but in Arizona we had this weekly lottery. And, if you, and I'm not saying you should play the lottery, but if you did, your odds of winning the lottery every week, 52 weeks in a row, for 27,000 years in a row, is mathematically better than one DNA chromosome forming on its own. <laughs> and they don't need one, they need billions. That's the reason the law of biogenesis, real science, a believer's best friend, has never been overcome. We're being misled by false science. Real science is our best friend. Evidence number three is neo-Darwinism. This is what's actually taught, has been for a long time now. But they teach that, well, mutations are what create the new and beneficial genetic information to promote and power Darwinian-style change. Neo-Darwinism. They have a lot of different examples of mutations that they use. Uh, frame shifts are one of their more popular. They come in inversions, deletions, insertions, point and hox genes mutations. Um, but mutations result in the sorting or the loss of functional genetic information, not in the gain of new and beneficial genetic information. This is a scientific principle called genetic or gene depletion. Um, copying errors, duplication errors is one of their favorites as well. In fact, I, just to give you a hint, if you want to win a debate with a, a college professor or anybody else, they won't debate, by the way, because they would lose, but if you want to win that debate, all you have to say is they cannot produce new and beneficial genetic information. If you say they can't produce new information, you lose the debate. Because you can mix up information and lose the functionality, but it's new information. 
they've got new information. But if you say they can't produce new and beneficial, then you will win the debate. Please keep that in mind. But copying errors, they claim copying errors power Darwinian change. But these have nothing to do with the creation of new and beneficial genetic information. It'd be like if you took my book, The Cost, and, you, and there was a copying error, and you had two page 53s. You added no new information, you just copied existing information. So if a fly has a copying error and ends up with four wings, that's not an improvement because he won't have the, the other pieces and nerves so he can use those wings. So they're useless, he probably can't fly at all, and he is immediately removed by a process that we call natural selection, which I call God's quality assurance program, by the way. <laughs> um, evidence number four is at the college level, they will not define the difference between micro and macro evolution. Now, in real science and engineering, my dad was an electrical engineer and an avionics engineer with 29 U.S. patents. He helped design the first uh, guidance systems for our initial ICBMs back in the 70s. And um, he, um, when in real science and engineering, we break things down to the billionth of a degree, but they won't even make the differentiation between micro and macro. There's a reason for that. Darwinian would be macro change, one kind like a dog producing a non-dog. I mean, they show a dog-like animal eventually turned into a whale, so that's actually what they teach. There's no evidence to support that that holds up to scrutiny, but that would be macro change, one kind changing into another kind. But the only thing that we see is micro change, micro evolution, micro adaptations, micro transitions. It's all the same thing. It's like you step out on your front porch, your front deck, your front patio. It's the same thing. Micro change is a scientific fact. In fact, in every experiment, millions of experiments, it's found in every single one. Dogs will bring forth dogs. People will bring forth people. Pine trees will bring forth pine trees, and you can have changes due to the sorting or the loss, gene depletion, of the starting information, but one kind will only bring forth after its kind. That's a scientific fact. It's microevolution, microadaptations, whatever you want to call it. It's microchange. Why is it vital for Christians to understand it's a scientific fact that kinds will bring forth after their kind? Why is it vital, especially for kids in high school and college, to understand this? Because ten times in the book of Genesis, we're told plants or animals will bring forth after their kind. And the only thing that real science, a believer's best friend, has ever found is that kinds bring forth after their kind, just like we're told ten times in the book of Genesis. The kids are being shown micro changes and being led to think the Bible's not true. Hmm. But micro adaptations are also caused by the sorting or loss of this parent starting genetic information, gene depletion. So kids in school, in the humanistic schools, are given lots of examples of biblically correct micro change, and then they switch the discussion to Darwinian macroevolution, and kids think this proves the Bible isn't true. Do you see that? If the church would get this into the church, we wouldn't be losing 90% of our kids. I'm going to talk about the reason the church blocks us later today. Has to do with older beliefs, by the way. But Darwin has spoken a discussion on micro because they don't have any evidence of Darwinian macro to show anybody. They never have. And here's how I've been showing for 20 years. I've been showing people how to destroy Darwinism scientifically in four seconds flat. Start your watch. Gene depletion plus natural selection makes Darwinism impossible. Stop your watch. Oh, I'm sorry, that was three seconds flat. That's the reason there's no evidence of Darwinian change. It's a scientific impossibility. Okay, here's an email I got. If kinds only bring forth after their kind like the Bible says, why aren't there articles in, about this in peer-reviewed science journals? Well, because secularists and humanists own the peer review process. If you say, if you do anything that goes against their foundation billions of years of time, or anything that goes against Darwinian evolutionism, your paper is immediately disqualified. So you're not going to find them in there in the humanistic peer review processes. A growing number of editors are now coming out and saying the peer review process is deceitful. It has undermined science, scientific education, and I will tell you it has undermined the faith of billions of people around the globe. 
The Lancet is the most prestigious British uh, medical journal. They had to, a year and a half ago, retract over 100 published articles after finding out the peer review process was so deceitful, scientists were reviewing their own papers, they were trading off, you pass my paper, I'll pass your paper, and putting lies and frauds into their paper. They had to retract over 100 published articles. The editor stated, think about what he said, much of scientific literature may be untrue. Is that shocking? Scientists often sculpt data to fit their world view which is billions of years leading to Darwinian evolutionism. The editor of America's most prestigious scientific journal stated, think about what she says here, it's no longer possible to believe published research. Darwinian, millions of years leading to Darwin, Darwinism are two religious beliefs that everyone is forced to adhere to today and that has undermined science, scientific education, and the saving faith of billions of people. And I get Christians all the time come up to me, well, it's scientific. No, it's not. It's false science. Beware of science falsely, so-called. Real science is our best friend. But kinds only bring forth after their kind, like the Bible says, through micro-change caused by the sorting or the loss of the parent's genetic information as gene pools get weaker and weaker and weaker. That's what, that's what breeders use. I used to have a purebred yellow lab. To get purebred yellow labs, breeders breed puppies together with the traits they like and they're breeding out, they're losing through gene depletion what they don't want. Once you get to a purebred like a yellow lab, if you breed two purebred yellow labs together, your puppy is going to be yellow labs. That's the only information they have left. If you breed two mutts together, guess what your puppy is going to be? <laughs> you don't have any idea, do you? Uh, Darwinism evidence number five is similar biochemistry. You ever heard that chimpanzees and humans share 98% the same in their, in their uh, biochemistry? Have you ever heard that one? They throw that out all the time, don't they? Now, real science, a believer's best friend, I've seen published studies that have a 30% difference. So why are they continuing to say it's only a 2% difference? That's just a lie in the textbook. In fact, if gen uh, genetic similarity proves our evolutionary past, they should teach that we're coming from worms. Our biochemistry is 75% the same as that from some worms. Your biochemistry is 50% the same as that from a banana. <laughs> Anyone evolved from a banana? Just four or five. That's not bad. <laughs> I kind of had my, my feeling you might raise your hand at that one. But the um, <clears throat> Last time I asked this at a college campus, 500 students raised their hand, and they weren't joking. They were serious because they've been taught we've all evolved from a common ancestor, which would mean you are related to bananas. I got on the internet that night, you know, you check your family tree. It was a banana in the whole bunch. Oh, I heard that. Didn't find that very appealing, did you? So similar biochemistry has some, something to do with us having a similar designer, not that we evolved from a wet rock. Um, uh, number six is uh, antibiotic or poison resistance. Bacteria becoming resistant to an antibiotic or, or insects becoming resistant to insecticides. Now let me use uh, cockroaches just as a simple example. Let's say we had a thousand cockroaches right here on the floor. And it's running right toward these, these four lovely women in the front row. <laughs> but just before they got there, I sprayed them all with insecticide and it killed all of them. Except for two. Two survived. Did those two instantaneously evolve an immune system? Of course not. They already had the gene in their gene pool that allowed them to survive that poison. The others didn't have it, or it was switched on or off, as the case might be, and so they were killed. Now, the two that survived, when they have offspring, they inherit the same genetic uh, information, and the new population is immune to the poison. They evolved nothing. So why is this one of the supposed big proofs of Darwinian evolution today? Because they've got nothing. Gene depletion plus natural selection makes Darwinian change a scientific impossibility. Uh, evidence number seven from embryology. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. How's a kid going to stand up and argue with that, right? Now, this was invented back in 1869, 10 years after Darwin's book came out. Ernst Haeckel loved the idea because it got God out of the picture. 
And he had the same problem Darwinists have today. He, he couldn't find any evidence that it ever took place. So he did what Darwinists have become famous for. He, he made up evidence. And he, he made these drawings. Now, from left to right across the top are his drawings. Right below are the photos that don't look like his drawings. And it was proven in the 1870s that Haeckel had taken a human embryo and made copies of the human, labeling them fish, salamander, turtles, chickens, etc., and came up with ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, which means you go through your evolutionary stages while you're in your mother's womb. Proven fraud in the 1870s and still taught in colleges today. In fact, here's a new college textbook. And it says, kids, kids, whether they develop into fish, amphibians, or humans, all vertebrate embryos start out very similar with gill slits and a long tail. And what do they use for their proof? Haeckel's original drawings. Proven fraud in the 1870s. And it goes on, so ask yourself, kids, why would humans have embryos with gill slits and a long tail unless their ancestors had them? And kids by the millions lose their faith and think science has proven we evolved from a wet rock. First of all, you never had a tail. We, we call the end of our spine, the end of our backbone, a tailbone. It has nothing to do with it being a tail. And you never have slits or gills. Those are just folds in the skin that later develop in your organs in your throat and neck area. No tail, no gills. No gill slits where the gills used to go. Just another fraud. Proven fraud in the 19th century, <clears throat> still fraud in the 21st century. Evidence number eight, the fossil record. You hear the fossil record supports Darwinian change. The fossil record is a total embarrassment to Darwinian evolutionism. Now here's an evolutionary tree of life. You guys have probably seen these before, right? Oh, and at the, at the base, they have the words invertebrate ancestor, and they have these nice colorful lines connecting everything in the world to the word invertebrate ancestor. I mean, what more for proof of Darwinian change could you want than someone typing in the word invertebrate ancestor and drawing colorful lines to everything, right? Does anyone actually see any proof of Darwinism there? But kids see this, and they assume that's based on scientific evidence, and there is no evidence behind it. You know, taking a box of crayons and, and coloring lines connecting things doesn't prove anything. There, there's an old saying that goes like this. Darwinists are experts at drawing things that never existed to support their theory that never took place. <laughs> Bottom line is this. If you take away their box of crayons, they're left with nothing. But they own the system. Here, here's, one, here's just one example. They're teaching kids the lobe fin fish was, a, was the link between fish and amphibians. And the story goes, the lobe fin couldn't swim, so he walked around on the bottom of the ocean on those lobe fins. I guess he got bored one day, and he walked out on land and became an amphibian. Wow, it's a nice story. You know, but the, but the amphibian has feet, shoulders, claws, elbows, a central nervous system, a skeletal system, a muscular system that fish don't have. Oh, and real science, a believer's best friend, knows of no way for nature to add any type of beneficial information of of any appreciable amount, much less the millions of pieces this would require. Or an even worse, real, for, for Darwinists, real science, a believer's best friend, we've now found the lobe fin fish, which they, which they say went on land and the lobe fin has been extinct for 300 plus million years. Well, he's now been found alive in several of today's oceans. <laughs> Not extinct, 300 plus million years. And he doesn't walk around on the bottom of the ocean, he's a very good swimmer. Oh, and think about this. The fossilized version, which is supposed to be 300 plus million years old, and the living lobe fin, they're both identical. I thought things evolved over millions of years of time. And that doesn't happen. Gene depletion plus natural selection. So, appropriately, on April Fool's Day, uh, one of what is, I call their two messiahs, Tetalic Rosea, the other one's Lucy. We'll talk about that in a, in a couple minutes. But Tetalic was announced on April Fool's Day, 2006, and it's now one of the messiahs, the two messiahs of Darwinism. <clears throat> the New York Times wrote when it was released, think about what this says. Well, it's still a fish, okay? It's a fish. But it, think about this. It's exhibiting changes that anticipate the beginnings of wrists, elbows, and shoulders. Think about that. It doesn't have the beginnings of wrists or elbows or shoulders. It is... 
anticipating those things. It doesn't even have them. It doesn't have anything. It has a little nubby bone in its side. Keep that in mind. Tetalic and the fossilized lobefin fish both have this same nubby bone in their side. And so does the living lobefin fish today. The living lobefin fish and the fossilized lobefin fish have that same nubby bone. It never changed to anything, much less into wrists, elbows, shoulders, nerve connections, muscular tissues, skeleton. On and on it goes. And that this is one of their messiahs today. In fact, there are several living fish, some catfish that have that same nubby bone today that's never changed into anything else. Real science shows it's a fraud. It's one of their messiahs today. And if you think it's me saying they don't have any evidence in the fossil record, they actually have a key theory for Darwinism. It's called punctuated equilibrium. If you ask a professor, why don't you have any evidence in the fossil record? He'll say, punctuated equilibrium. Don't you know anything? What that means is, Evolution didn't happen over a long period of time that would have left evidence behind, you know, real science based on evidence. No, it, it, there was a spurt of evolution and a long period with no change. They call it stasis. And a spurt of evolution and a long period with no change. And because of that, no evidence was captured in the fossil record. <laughs> yeah, it's not, they, they've got a theory to explain why they've got no evidence. Well, I thought science was knowledge derived from the study of evidence. Evidence number nine, similar bone structure proves our evolutionary past. And this college textbook shows kids really nice drawings of, of the, you know, the forearm limb of a, of a frog or a lizard or a human. And they say, look, you all have two bones in the forelimb, proof we've all evolved from a common ancestor. Well, who is the common ancestor this college book says we've all evolved from? Believe it or not, the lobe fin fish. They're teaching we evolved from the lobe fin fish, which is found in the fossil record and alive today with no change whatsoever. Now, I can stand here and make Darwinism look totally dishonest and but actually downright stupid, but I'm not in those classrooms, and kids are being taught this as a scientific fact, and they don't have the information to back it up that it's not. Wow. You know, I say they have similar bone structure because they have the same designer. Why don't you just teach kids both views? You can think this is because you evolved from a rock, or do you think maybe it's because you have the same designer? See, if you give kids both choices, it's a no-brainer, which is why they don't do it. So I drive a Ford pickup truck. My next-door neighbor has a Ford van. Their dashboards are identical. <laughs> it's not because they evolved from a moped, right? <laughs> it's because they have the same designer. Similarities are proof of design. It's, it's proof of your biblical designer. It's not proof that you evolved over the, overcoming all sorts of scientific laws and principles and leaving no evidence behind. So evidence number 10 for Darwinian evolution are the hominids, the closest link between ape and man, the hominids. And here's a textbook showing humans related to all sorts of things, including fish and jellyfish and worms. And what's their proof? A nice red line. What more for proof could you want than a red line, right? <laughs> How about some fossil evidence? Let's look at a couple of the most famous hominids that have caused not millions, billions of people to reject Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Uh, Piltdown Man was the Messiah from about 1910 till the mid-1950s. Um, it misled so many people that we finally kicked creation and prayer out of our schools, start teaching our children they evolved without God, and we can see what the changes on a nation uh, have been since then. I cover that in a couple of our other messages. But the um, Piltdown Man, what they did was they, they, they found a, a piece of a human skull and the jawbone, and what they did was they took, actually they found out in the mid-50s finally, they'd taken a piece of a human uh, skull cap and the jawbone from an orangutan, filed them down so they fit together, acid treated both sides, buried them in a rock quarry, left them there for two years, came along and dug up Piltdown Man and spent the rest of their lives as world-renowned Darwinists, speaking on any college campus they wanted and misled not millions, billions of people into rejecting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So many people that we kicked creation and prayer out of our schools and started teaching our kids they evolved without God. And then it was finally discovered these jokers had done this whole fraud and misled millions of people. Beware of science falsely, so-called. 
They used Nebraska man as proof of Darwinism. All that was found in Nebraska man was a piece of a broken tooth. But they're pretty creative. From that broken tooth, they recreated Nebraska man, his family, even the tools they would have worked with. From a piece of a broken tooth. It was later proven that tooth came from an extinct pig. There's a real Nebraska man right there. <laughs> so their other Messiah is Lucy. Been a, been a Messiah since uh, about 1974, about 45 years now. And they, they found about a third of a skeleton, but they said when they found it, well, the, the femur, the thigh bone, angles to the knee, and humans have angle thigh bones, proving it's an ape becoming a human. They forgot to mention that all tree-dwelling apes have angle femurs. Now, they say, well, the knee bone, the, the knee joint is slightly bigger than a normal ape's knee, proving it's becoming a human. Well, if you took the knee joint of everybody in this room, they'd be different sizes. It hasn't proved anything. They also forgot to mention the knee bone in question was found over a mile away and 230 feet deeper in the strata layer. If that was Lucy's knee, I want to see the freight train that hit that monkey. It must be going about <laughs> 900 miles an hour right through the brush, boy. This from 1987. Anatomists have concluded these are not a link between ape and man and did not walk upright like a human. They stood three and a half feet tall, drug their knuckles on the ground. They have curved fingers and curved toes so they can grab onto tree limbs. Yet here's a modern textbook with a nice drawing of Lucy walking upright like a human with normal human feet and talking on a cell phone. <laughs> what are the odds of that? My friends, think about it logically. With millions of various apes and monkeys having lived and died over the last 500 years alone, why does finding a monkey bone prove we evolved from a wet rock? Doesn't it just prove that monkeys, when they die, they leave their bones behind? Yeah. And those, my friend, are the top 10 evidences for the religious fairy tale of Darwinian evolutionism, which has misled 90% of our children and grandchildren. And I'm challenging the church to stop compromising and start standing on the truth of God's word. We've got to stop losing 90% of our kids. This, I've been saying this for 20 years. I'm not getting anywhere with it. But if anyone wants me to come and speak at their church, you let me know. I will do it. And we will, we will show everyone that they can trust God's word. Word for word and cover to cover. Thank you. But those are their top 10 evidences. Pew and Barna Research report that up to 90% of our children are leaving the church by the age of 20. And the reasons that they're listing are the number one, the teaching of Darwinian evolution, meaning the Bible's not true. It's thinking that the Bible's not rational, not rational compared to what? To the Darwinian teachings. And thinking that there's no proof that the Bible's true. Like maybe that kinds only bring forth after their kind, like the Bible says, but kids aren't learning that. They're not being told this, and they think the church has no answers. The church has the answers. They're blocking it because they don't want to upset the old earth believers. And you tell good from bad by what? The fruit. I used to believe in millions of years. I'm not attacking anyone there. I'm challenging you to humble yourself to the real science into the Word of God. Because we're to avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. The calling of our ministry is to teach about creation, evolution, and age of issues, provide a reason for the hope that's in the heart of all true believers and all true seekers. We do this through our various teachings and PowerPoint presentations. Let me end with this. Let's be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. And today they're deceiving 90% of our children and grandchildren. My friends, we need to do something about that. Let me end my part with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning and every dear soul that's here today. I hope and I pray the information that we shared will be eye-opening, faith-building, even, even challenging as, ne as needed. And that just as I was once a theistic evolutionist, it'll help us to find the truth 
and stay on that narrow pathway that leads to that straight gate into heaven with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his great name I do pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. This has been Defending Biblical Creation, presented by Russ Miller. To receive a free catalog of hundreds of awesome Bible studies on DVD video and audio CD, all using and defending a literal translation of the Bible, information on upcoming Bible conferences in your area, or details of our missionary outreach and trips to Israel, call Compass at 800-977-2177 24 hours a day, or visit us on the web at compass.org. And be sure to like us on Facebook. Search facebook.com slash compassbible.